with the television version, uh, Julie and Louie Dreyfus, because she could kick Louie's butt. <laughs> and for the theatrical version, um, you know, I have to go a little more theatrical. Um, Winona Ryder. <laughs> Too whiny. <laughs>
stuck in the basement of the ATF? Oh, yeah, that's fun. that was actually my favorite episode to do. Um, first of all, it took like a couple of days. We had so many lines in that. Um, but, uh, and I got to record last, as I recall. So I, so she, her voice was already on tape when I got there. So yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun. It's, it's one of those rare chances you get to actually act when you do uh, cartoon voices. Um, there was some stuff that, in that scene that was cut out. That, I don't know if you're aware of, but she had a, a nude scene in there. <laughs> And when she took a shower. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> More questions. Stick your arms up. Stick your hands up. Stick any one. Uh, why don't you just give uh, where, where were you born and raised? Or where you based on? Oh, um, I was born in San Juan, Puerto Rico, and uh, moved to California when I was about a year old, and grew up in San Fernando Valley. Um, I was born in El Paso, Texas, and <laughs> raised in uh, Montana and Arizona, and has lived here for about 14 years. I was born in Brooklyn. <laughs> I was born in Hollywood, California, if you may have heard. <laughs> and uh, raised in Los Angeles. And uh, for the past many years, I've been living out of the United States in Italy. Uh, I was born in Denver, Colorado, but I was raised in um, the Valley, the Valley group. And also, um, Costa Mesa, lived there for a long time. I, I never learned to speak well. <laughs> uh, ladies and gentlemen, right. Miss Wendy Lee. Right. I was born in Butte, Montana, and uh, was raised there and in Seattle, and I moved to Hollywood. Yeah. 
you know, it was a positive working experience. It was great reaction that I got. At least I think that's my take on it. Yeah, it was fun. And uh, generally speaking, it was a lot of hard work. We had fun doing it. And uh, it's extremely rewarding to see the reaction, positive reaction, to see how this, uh, this beast that we released has uh, taken on a life of its own and continued to grow and, uh, and has a lot of interest for a lot of people all over the world. So we can't feel anything but uh, pride in, uh, in what we've done and, and uh, happiness to see that you, that you guys all enjoy it. it. It reminded us of the fact that we started, we knew each other, we've known each other obviously more than 10 years and uh, I think that Robotech might have been the beginning for all of us to create this kind of little family unit that we have. We are, we are a close-knit group of people. We don't see each other all the time, but we have strong relationships out of having worked together, and Robotech was kind of like the beginning of it, so we have a lot of affection for those memories. One thing I've always been curious about, does Jimmy Flippers pictures look like <laughs> Not on microphone. <laughs> no, he talks that way. Well, I remember uh, since I was in junior high, Robotech's been in my blood. It's just like the one thing when I was a child that I really liked besides Transformers and all those other little things. That's why it's exciting for me today. But all through life, I sometimes get raised by eyebrows so because I do quotes from all through the series. And I was wondering if you like you guys used to those quotes just like, you know, They tend to crop up. <laughs> half the time we're not even entirely sure where they come from. <laughs> I gotta say half the day I'm with, with this guy, I'm always bringing quotes and saying, where's it from? And I make him think for minutes. You weren't on stage last night. No, I just I came here today and oh. I was extremely excited about the case of the internet. Trivia contest Unfortunately I have to work it off. <laughs> Somebody has to, we don't. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mike has, but the rest of us don't. Another hand. Another question. Can you tell us about how you get started in doing voiceovers and what made you add to the Poverty is a good reason. Who wants to tackle this? Well, it really beat waiting tables. I was in a uh, show, a musical show called Company, and the bass player said, you're good, I played a role with the Patter song, the fast song. He said, you're good with those voices, you know, working your mouth fast. <laughs> anyway, um, so uh, he said, my, my, uh, my former wife works for this Japanese company and does little cartoon voices, and I had written a tape, because I, it's just something in my blood. I was, when I was a kid, I, I liked doing voices. I made friends that way when I moved from New York to New Jersey and back again. I used to do Magoo, Mr. Magoo. And I made, that's how I, I became somebody with friends. <laughs> At 12 years old, you know. New kid, you know. Anyway, so. Uh, I forgot what was the question. <laughs> Yeah. 
you're, you you want to get one that's a SAG franchise agent. They're, they're the SAG legitimate. Actors Guild. But they're the legitimate agents. They're the only ones that you really want to get. You don't want to ever pay any money to an agent. You just you know they they are the ones. You're hiring them actually is what's happening. So don't ever let anybody try to, to get money out of you. So they're more like a broker. Yeah. Well, yeah, they have access to where the, the parts are. There's, you, guys, you guys have been talking about uh, generally commercial voiceovers, but the this kind of stuff, we're talking Robotech, Delhi, that sort of thing, it's a little bit different. There's such a tiny group of people, you're looking at about half the group up here, uh, almost, uh, that do most of the work. Um, it's really a, an aspect of the, of the industry that very few people know about, and even fewer know how to do. If you're interested specifically in dubbing, there's a little bit different way to go. You're not going to get an agent for dubbing work, generally speaking. Uh, frankly, you would have to get in touch with some of the companies that release the cartoons or films, whatever they have to be. Uh, you can present yourself. A tape is not a bad idea. But since you're working with something that's on screen, that's the hard part. There are no classes. And even if there were, they wouldn't help you very much. Unfortunately, improv helps as an overall yeah. talent. Dubbing, unfortunately, you have to learn by dubbing. And uh, if you're interested in doing that, contact the companies that do the jobs. Say you're interested in doing it. And getting, when they have the opportunity, the directors may put you into what's called a Walla session. Noises, crowds, things like that, and usually small role bits, one and two lines. From that, as a film is being done, they'll choose some of this. Say, here, there's a this girl has to run in, say something, and run out. Do it. And from these roles, they will see if you have if you come up with the energy, how good your acting is, if your sync is all right, how fast you can do a line, meaning how many takes. And from that you will get bigger and bigger roles. More or less all of us started doing that uh, if you're talking about <coughs> kind of two different worlds. One thing that uh, Greg did mention is that it's as hard to get into this as it is to become a movie star. <laughs> it's, it's, it's not as, it's, the pay isn't as good. <laughs> it's not bad. But uh, it is <laughs> difficult. Uh, it's, it's hard to get out. Hard to get out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, as far as uh, having an agent is concerned, for the uh, an agent is necessary for commercials and uh, that sort of thing. And uh, doing doing cartoons from scratch. That is ones that haven't been already done. Uh, you know, where they do the voices first draw the pictures to fit the voices. That you need an agent for. But most of us, for, uh, for this sort of uh, cartoons, for dubbing, we just stay home and wait for somebody to call. Yeah. And they always do. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. Maybe for yeah. you. <laughs> yes. Did you, say, did you want to hear some of the Vanessa? Oh, oh yeah. I thought you said what? Oh, oh yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah, see, I always have trouble with lines. Can you give me a line? Somebody come up with a Vanessa line. <laughs> oh, yeah. Captain Hayes just happens to be in love with you. Does Captain Hayes? Oh, very good. There you go. <laughs> yeah, she's, she's pretty innocent. She, um, I always thought that, you know, she had another side of her that was kind of, you know, dying to get out, but, you know, she, uh, <laughs> she was always, you know, she seemed very tame, of course, on the outside. Um, yeah, what was the line again? Captain Hayes, what was it? Just happens to be in love with you. Rick. Rick. Captain Hayes just happens to be in love with you. She's <laughs> real good at that. having an agent. I worked without an agent until just a few years ago, really. And um, 
a lot of it is kind of a, a referral system. We use a lot of people who kind of have the skill, and there is a skill involved with it. It's not something everyone is good at or can acquire. And um, that's why we often are the same people that are used again and again, because once you have it, it's really a knack, and it's uh, something that you can lend yourself to in a, in a variety of roles and ways. And also, uh, we all work fast. If we didn't work quick, we wouldn't be working as much as we do. So that has a lot to do with it. More questions? Yeah. Um, for Reba, um, when you were growing up or in high school, did you get any uh, either compliments or get made fun of about your voice? Do you remember? Well, the greatest thing about my voice, because it sounds like a kid, is that you know if somebody calls me up on the phone, they always say, "Did your mom call?" <laughs> so it works out really great. You know, if there's a, like a telephone solicitor, I can go. Um, my mom and dad are busy here in the bedroom right now. <laughs>
fiction that, that I read, and sometimes non-fiction that I read, is, is science and science fiction. So, um, I don't think it was really that I was uncomfortable with that. It was just like, like he said, sometimes we did stuff even out of sequence, so I wouldn't see what led up to that. So, I'd be talking about something before I was sort of introduced to it. Right. Right. You know, I would not get the other half of the conversation. They fast forward past the loops of the other person. Uh, you know, and, and or or they're not done yet. So I don't know what the response of the other person is. It may be written on the page. Sometimes they haven't decided what the other person is going to say back to me yet. So I oftentimes was very much just sort of working in a void. So it wasn't really a discomfort with, with science fiction, which I've really never been uncomfortable with. It was really a discomfort not knowing where I was or what was happening yet. Most of us have that problem. Yeah. However, we were wonderful with the romance. <laughs> How do you bring the emotion into it? Then? Whether it's an exclamation or it's a flatter voice or because what uh, emotion has to come or inflection has to come to so depend on what happens. Well, besides my beating them with a cane, <laughs> that's called acting. Yeah, also, it's a tremendous use of your imagination. But if you cannot, if you do not know what the previous sentence was, you cannot use your imagination. Well, that's part of what the director's for. The director in, in the session has the overall vision and, and, and it helps guide you and lets you know very quickly what's going on. Um, uh, unless, you know, he's being funny. But, uh, he, uh, and you just, you draw from the dialogue. The, the dialogue in Robotech was particularly easy to do because it's so well written. And so you could really draw from just what the emotion of the character, you can see the picture, the director tells you the context and what you're doing, and then you just let the emotions play. That's, uh, it helps a lot if you wrote the episode. <laughs> advantage with what we're doing in this form of having that visual. But when you're originating animation, you don't have anything visual to work with at all. You're using just what's written and creating it. But you're originating it in that case. But um, really, it's the acting skills that come in. It's really how much you can emote and, and make it fine. Uh, do you ever get to see on screen what, their, what emotions you're going through first and go back and actually dub it in? Or you just... Rehearsal. Yeah. Rehearsal. Yeah. Depends on the direction. You you mean go way back so you know, so you know what happened before. Well, let's say you have a scene that you're going to actually dub in. Can you see the scene first and go back and dub it in? Oh yeah. 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 No. Most, no. We don't most of us rehearse on tape. Yeah, we not the whole scene. But no. oh, the whole scene. No. Back and no. See the scene. No. Or a line or two. I thought you were talking about when you're when you're about to do a loop. No. If you want, you can see it first see before it. you do it. And when they're doing the playback, that's when you read. You read a you read a little bit. You know, you know it's going to play back to see if it looped in properly. We always check each line, always usually, and <laughs> depending on the director. And um, and what when that's happening, sometimes you just read down and get get your continuity as quickly as you can. And you can also say, wait a minute, let me know. What would Sometimes, sometimes if the scene's difficult, uh, they'll, they'll watch it. Uh, another way to tell is if occasionally we finish a loop and Greg would be rolling and laughing. Because we will, we will have gotten the opposite meaning out of the line and somehow. Wildly inappropriate. Exactly. Actually, there was one time that Carl put together a rehearsal for us after we knew that Road 10 was a go and we started a new season. We all got together and remember this. We all got together over a big conference table and just kind of read the script and as the, uh, the picture was playing. And it kind of turned into a big party. <laughs> yeah, the yeah. last yeah. rehearsal. I think that was the last time we've ever done that. Yeah. Yeah. The only time. <laughs> More questions? Um, for those who are uh, married or involved with somebody, how does your husband or wife or partner feel about your success if they ever try to imitate you? <laughs> <laughs> well, my daughter just started doing ADR for the first time about a month ago. She's ten and a half and is having fun with it, so she she enjoys it. Um, my 
kids, I've been doing this since my kids were born, so they're pretty jaded about it. You know, is that your voice on TV? Yeah, okay. They want to <laughs> and my wife is an ADR writer. She writes uh, ADR scripts for Power Rangers and television shows. Um, my daughter started doing it too. She just replaced a, a voice on Power Rangers the other day. Yeah, and she was really good, and now she wants an agent, and I try to talk to her. <laughs>
single, it could be a hospital, it could be a church. <laughs> it could be a trans, it doesn't make a difference. It's there, it's in every single person all the time. <laughs> it's his signature. <laughs> Uh, some of the voices in Robotech we heard over and over again, um, but I don't remember hearing Tony or Reba in past the macro series. Did you much do much work for the second two series? Or? In what? Um, uh, for, well, no, actually, no, I didn't. Uh, Carl's uh, opinion was that my voice was too recognizable and therefore couldn't be in the rest of them. But he did cast me in Captain Harlock, which was a few weeks later. And I played Christopher, which meant it was eight weeks of talking real hard like this and annoying a lot of engineers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sometimes the, uh, a certain character, a certain voice, sometimes a certain character, a certain voice, is so recognizable. <laughs> Rick, Rick has a recognizable voice, so in the same series, to bring in would be rather confusing. It doesn't matter what face you put on, all you're going to be thinking is, that's redundant. <laughs> I know it's redundant. <laughs> so uh, sometimes that happens, and with Rebo also, it's just too particular. So in another series, it's fine, but it's not the same film. More questions? What did the uh, new generation, uh, the Mosquito section of the Robotech, you basically hear, hear uh, Melanie's voice as uh, Arlene, and we recognize this. I asked Carl the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> the producer is God. <laughs> Start the recording thing. 
relate to the karate movies? Very uh, similar. <laughs> <laughs> Different country. We all have karate movie stories. <laughs> I worked on that Spanish soap opera into English, and there was one day of, shoot, of, of dubbing where the woman that I was dubbing, the actress on, in, in the soap opera, hit a table and hurt her leg and started to go ow, 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 and giggle. And I had to dub her going ow, 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 and giggling in English to match it, which had nothing to do with the storyline. But, you know, they didn't stop and re-shoot. It was just the strangest job. I think probably the worst experience in dubbing is when you have to do a, uh, a slaughter scene and it goes on and on and on. Screaming, yeah. Constant screaming. Uh, I was in a dubbing session for Beastmaster. <laughs> what did you call me? There, <laughs> there's more screaming per square inch in that film than anything I've ever seen. And it took us three days to, to dub it. And we had three, four, eight-hour sessions of screaming. And I couldn't even speak after we finished. I mean, that's <laughs> a lot of actors when they get these jobs. They don't have time. Sometimes the people are nasty to call them, but they don't warn them. They, they get a bonus for all that screaming. Because they know they're going to lose work afterwards. Or at least two or three days. <laughs>
and uh, I do some other things outside of this, but it's all sort of, you know, within the same realm. I have one final thing, which relates to everything. Just one final thing to say before we uh, go outside there. He has to have the last one. I have to have one. Damn directors. <laughs> <laughs> and that is support Streamline. Not because he's a friend, Carl, uh, but because Streamline is doing something that nobody, seriously, nobody else is doing. The quality of the work that he is turning out is head and shoulders above everybody else's. His attitude towards what he is doing, he is not cranking stuff out to make a buck. He is trying to improve, or at least maintain, if the quality was on in the first place, the quality of Japanese animation and other films, not only uh, Japanese animation. And uh, it's a very tough job, because there are an awful lot of other people doing it who are, who will sometimes be a little quicker than he is to nab the rights for something, uh, and they blow it quite frankly. They dub it badly, or they release it badly, or they make it disappear, or whatever the reasons are. Um, support Streamline, because he really is doing the best job, I think, that uh, anybody can in this field. Let's go outside and we'll sign some autographs. Thank <laughs> you. 